Marta is out. Uh, Marie. Present, calling from Milan, Michigan. Great. And Elizabeth Thompson. Present, calling from Ypsilanti Township. Okay. Ellen Offen. Oop, Ellen, you're muted. <laughs> President calling for me in our I'm sorry. <laughs> you're okay. And Steve Stein. Hi, President, calling for me in Arbor. I don't see Bennett yet. And Margaret Reynolds? Hi, uh, uh, President, and calling in from Pittsfield Township. And Jason Maschewski. President, attending remotely, currently driving in Ypsilanti Township. <laughs> Perfect. Are you have us updated on uh, every jurisdiction line you cross too, Jason? I could if you want me to. I'm going to be no, crossing a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very poor, great. Um, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, public participation. I see that we have four attendees right now. If uh, any of you would like to make a comment, feel free to raise your hand. All right, seeing none, um, we'll close that. And then there's no commission response to public participation. And that brings us to the report from the Board of Commissioners. I'll turn it over to you, Jason. Thank you. Uh, I'll be brief here. I, first off, uh, my efforts to find a new person from District 1 continue. Uh, I had somebody that was interested, but unfortunately they do not live in the county and uh, although they work in the county. And unfortunately, um, the resolution approving the Commission on Aging doesn't allow for that. So um, my search continues. Uh, I wanna point out as well um, that uh, there are, uh, I'm gonna forget the exact number, but uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of openings on a variety of county uh, commissions, committees, authorities, et cetera, and that, that application period is open not only for the Commission on Aging, but for others as well. So if you know people who are interested in participating, um, like you do on the Commission on Aging, but on other bodies, please encourage them to apply as it's that time of year for, for many of them uh, at this point. Uh, we uh, continue to move forward with uh, the American Rescue Plan Act um, in general. Uh, and recently approved the, the third bucket of, <clears throat> excuse me, funding for a, a variety of things, a rather large bucket um, of, of different initiatives, the, uh, which include the $4 million for uh, senior services that was proposed by this body. Uh, I do not have an update on the uh, process for collecting proposals for that. Um, pot of money yet. And I believe Peter is on the call. I don't know if Peter has any additional information on it. I believe that um, I would, I would think by the end of the calendar year, we're, we're publishing something and collecting those proposals. So um, I don't know if Peter has anything to add to that. I, I do. I can uh, say your timeline is basically right. Right now we're working on taking uh, the proposal that you all brought along with what was included in uh, the resolution that was actually approved to draft a request for proposals and develop what a review schedule and team will look like. Um, happy to share that information when we have more detail, um, just because one of, one of the major parts of American Rescue Plan funds is that we're reaching the two year mark of when everything will need to be uh, wrapped up by. So we'll wanna make sure that we move through this process as quickly as possible. And a big part of that a big part of that is going to be making sure we get the, the request for proposals out to as many people as possible who are interested in applying in as short a time period as possible. So uh, when that's officially live, we'll let you know so you can help uh, uh, get it out to folks. Hey, did I miss that? Or did you, um, Jason, did you mention an amount? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Steve, could you repeat that? I didn't know if you mentioned an amount. I might have missed that. Oh, an amount of four million. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, four million dollars. Um, in, in other general things about the commission at this point, uh, we are 
um, entering kind of the, the budget process at this point, we uh, had a presentation on Wednesday night um, on the uh, quadrennial budget for your budget and um, are going into approving process at our next couple of uh, two or three meetings as we go through the, the readings process and the potential amendment process on the budget. Um, I do not um, anticipate um, anything additional aging related that hasn't been talked about or already established to be included there. Um, but nonetheless, uh, I believe that the county in general terms is in pretty good shape when it comes to the budget. Uh, and one of the interesting facts, and although I don't have the numbers right in front of me, um, you know, we talk a lot about the county being a human services um, based uh, provider in, in, in interacting in that world. Uh, that is the number one category in terms of what we're funding with the budget, and that's been a historical thing, uh, followed by public safety and court services. Uh, so, you know, many of the, the things uh, that we do as a county are human services related, whether they're community mental health or public health or a variety of other things. Um, it's, I think it's interesting when people hear that, uh, they don't necessarily think about county government being a, that involved in human services. Um, so uh, something interesting I wanted to point out about the budget as well. Um, other than that, we're, we're kind of coming up to the end of the term. Uh, I think the, budgets, the budget uh, is going to be maybe the last big thing that we do. Uh, we do have some American Rescue Plan Act money left. Um, and I, I'm hoping that we talk about that in our board leadership meeting next week. But um, really, the budget is the last big, big responsibility that we have before the term ends and then a new county commission is seated in January. And uh, with that, I'll kind of uh, close and be happy to answer any questions that I can. Yeah, we have an, a question from Elizabeth. Uh, just, um, and you didn't mention, uh, Jason or Pete, Peter, any details about the folks who will be reviewing the proposals for that uh, $4 million. And I would just like to reiterate uh, the um, thought behind our written proposal as a commission that um, older adults are involved in the review of that process, whether it's us as a commission, whether it's some individuals, whether it's other older adults, but I think, um, that would be great if you can, uh, as you're working through those final details, uh, to keep that in mind. Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, uh, that's absolutely something I want to have happen. Uh, the way that ARPA proposals have been reviewed for other categories um, uh, are that we have teams of reviewers uh, that include citizen representatives as well. Uh, and uh, I have strongly encouraged Administrator Dill uh, to have older adults uh, be significantly involved in the process of reviewing these proposals. So, um, you know, I've, I've been, I think, pretty consistent with the administrator in making sure that that is going to happen. I'm not aware of anybody being named to the team for, this, for the senior services um, pot of money yet, um, but absolutely, um, Elizabeth want to do want to have that level of participation. Thanks, Jason. Yep. Uh, I have a question. The and it's not ARPA related. I have two questions actually. The county administrator a little while back was tasked with mapping existing county funds that are supporting older adult services. Um, is there any updates on that? Or I know because he's so busy, is there a timeline for that project? I'm not, I'm not aware of uh, any current progress on it, nor a definitive timeline on that question or the question of how a senior millage could be implemented uh, if it were passed. Uh, Peter, I don't know if you have any additional information on that. I do know that I talked to uh, Administrator Dill about this last week. Um, this is one of the topics of our check-in of, of, hey, we're quickly entering the fourth quarter of this year. Uh, we committed to bring something back in 2023. 
uh, and are, are very aware of the May and then August deadlines for those recommendations to come in. Um, so while there hasn't been movement, it's kind of was bumped to the top of both his and my calendar uh, for uh, figuring out where it fits in with this work uh, as we enter the final quarter of this year and first quarter next year, because that's really when a bulk of that work needs to happen in, in order to meet the deadlines. So uh, we're aware of the deadlines and we know that the general time frame for when that work needs to happen. And, and Marie, could I, could I, you reminded me of something. Um, if I could mention something else mm -hmm. in terms of an update, um, because I know you're you're involved with the Dexter um, Senior Center group. Yeah. Um, and just want to raise, just for everybody's awareness um, purposes, that um, you know the Dexter Senior Center is, is uh, having some uh, significant issues in terms of the future of their location, uh, and. Uh, you know, they are, they're losing their physical space uh, that they have in Dexter. And you may, you may remember that there was a millage question that was put up by the school district um, that would have included funds to, uh, to obtain senior center space um, and, and convert it. And that millage failed. Um, and now the Dexter Senior Center is searching for options in terms of where to physically locate uh, and I've talked with, uh, you know, the Jim Carson, uh, who's deeply involved over there and Ann Davis as well. Uh, and so it, it really, I want to highlight this because it raises an issue. I think that, you know, I wanted to be able to include in a millage situation is the ability to do capital projects. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, I think we're, we're at great risk at this point of the Dexter community not having any place for its older adults to congregate. And this includes their meals program. Um, they have a congregate meal program that is housed in their senior center and it's a jeopardy in this point. Um, so it's, uh, I wanted to raise that in front of this body just so everybody was aware of the situation in Dexter and, and Maria has been, been consulting and working with them and, and uh, you know, making some progress, but you know, it's a, it's a significant issue and um, just another reason why I believe we need to get a senior millage passed um, and to be able to address things, not only in terms of programs and services, but also just things like congregate space. Um, so we, yeah, I've, I've put Jim Carson and, and the Dexter folks in contact with um, folks at the county and uh, given him uh, some other referrals to, to potentially think through this issue. But I, I think it's quite a big issue out in the northwestern part of the county at this point. Marie, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. Yeah, it is. It is a big issue right now. Um, man, I have so much that I could say about it, but I don't know if it's appropriate in this body, in this space. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, as we talk more about, about pu public funds, specifically helping aging services, the import, I feel like Dexter losing something critical like this, and it's their hub to connect to other services, like what you might need at Jewish Family Services or Faith in Action or other things like that. And so they lose that that connection piece too. Um, I think that, yeah, there's there's a lot to be said there, um, especially as we, we um, consider the possibility of, of using them in, um, you know, as like a case, a case study, uh, uh, um, a case for support, you know, as we think about how public funds could be used and um, save those infrastructures in our county. Elizabeth, I see your hand up. You're muted, Elizabeth. It's interesting, Jason, just before the meeting started, we were talking about infrastructure in terms of our own homes. And I th thank you for raising that point. We tend to focus so much on services. I think that um, in the human services sphere that we forget that you have to have a place to deliver them. And especially um, when we're talking about things that can't be done virtually like congregate meals and so on. And um, I know this is an issue uh, for senior centers uh, statewide. And I know the head of the senior center um, in the Niles area, then you can, they did a, a retrofit of their space 
to make it more accessible. And he said their participation exploded. And I think that's a key point that we do need to think about is how we are able to fund. And the plus is those often are one-time funding or once every 30, 40 years funding um, that can make a tremendous difference. Margaret? Um, yeah, I just, I just wanted to add that the Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation is working uh, to provide some avenues for the Dexter uh, Senior Center. Um, uh, so it's on their uh, radar screen as well. But I think this story of uh, a vital, well, a very, very vital um, senior center um, experiencing these kinds of difficulties is exactly the story we need to tell around gaining support from other funding agencies and, and particularly from the county. So um, we need to make sure things like this are uh, well communicated. Maria, I want to close I just just by yeah. adding that I have to hop off in about seven minutes. I have a committee meeting of my board of directors that I have at nine o'clock. So I just wanted to add that as well. Yeah, super. Um, I had another question shifting topics. Um, and so the COA, our COA completely resets every two years. We get all, all new people. We all apply and, and potentially could be all new. Some of us could come back, right? I know other commissions have staggered, a staggered version of this. Um, is there a reason why when we were first made that we went for that route or is there a way that we could consider changing that in the future so we have some planned staggering? Um, so uh, any changes that might be made would, would have to be approved by the county commission. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not necessarily opposed to that. I think there's benefit to staggering it. The, the, the reason it was set up the way it is because each commissioner appoints a member. And so every two years we start a new county commission and that and it gives every commissioner the opportunity to, to do that. Um, but I'm not, I'm not opposed to staggering it and potentially changing the way that, that members are appointed to this body. But um, I think it would be I'm very open to discussing it if, if, if some of you want to recommend that or think about doing it. All right, great. Um, we can circle back the rest of the group. We can kind of circle back to that during new business if we want to. Peter, I see your hand up. Just since we're on that topic, just going to say it out loud, washington.org forward slash boards is where you can uh, find the uh, applications for the open seats so that you can all reapply if you so wish. washington.org forward slash boards. Nice. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Jason and Peter before we move on to the rest of our agenda? All right, thank you, Jason and Peter, for those updates and fielding our questions. Um, next, we have the approval of the minutes. Can I have someone make a motion? So moved. I saw Ellen's hand go up. <laughs> well, all right, so Ellen uh, makes the motion. And Margie, did I see that you were in a second? Yeah. Wonderful. Any discussion? All right, roll call vote, please. Okay, Marie Gress? Yes. Uh, Elizabeth Thompson? Yes. Ellen Offen? Yes. Steve Stein? Yes. Okay. Margaret Reynolds? Yes. And Jason Mastrowski? Yes. Okay, the minutes pass. Wonderful. Subcommittee updates. First up is communications, and I'll give that update. Um, Peter did some nice updates to our website, including the Zoom link for the public to join is on our landing page. So that's nice and easy and smooth. We used to make people 
download our agenda in order to click the link, um, but now they can just get to it right on the landing page. Marta spoke to the Ypsilanti Senior Center in September about the work that we're doing and talking about having um, some of them apply to be on the commission. And I have more on that later for her chair report. And then um, Peter did share with us the information on the all the commissions that have open seats, including our own. Um, I highly recommend that you share that with your networks, whether it's social media, email, um, getting coffee with a friend, all of that good stuff. Our commission, as well as many others, have open seats that we could use good bodies in. Any questions and communications? All right, next up is the needs assessment subcommittee, and that's my update as well. We had our monthly meeting and we further discussed the need for the countywide aging strategic plan. And we were talking mainly about how the AARP livable communities, um, age friendly communities could be part of that work. We're looking forward to hearing from Karen when she's able to come to our meetings. We're hoping to have her in November um, or December. We definitely want her this year, but we're waiting to, to coordinate that. Um, any questions on needs assessment? Wonderful. Any ARPA subcommittee updates? No. No. All right. And then potential millage updates. And again, the potential millage uh, uh, meetings are on hold until we uh, get some information as Peter referenced to the, about um, the assessment of where the county is spending dollars relating to uh, older adults. Great. All right, then we're gonna move on to our discussion items. First up, we have the nursing home presentation by Stephen, Louise, and Mary. So Stephen, I will turn it over to you. You're muted. There you go. All right, but can you see? Um, you can't see my screen, can you? No, not yet. At the bottom of uh, your, what kind of device are you on? I'm on Windows. Oh, here, hold okay. on, I got it, I got it, hold on. Okay, good. Uh, let's see, share screen. There we go. And let's see, can you see it now? No. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. That's I just, okay. I just uh, share. And there it goes. Yep, right. we got you now. Great. And let me turn it into presentation mode. And hopefully, full screen. Yes. Yes, you are. Mm -hmm. All right, great. So, um, I'm gonna tr um, I'm gonna look at my clock because I want to make sure that Luis and Mary have um, you know the optimal time because they're um, really doing a sort of humongous effort to try to make a difference in in our uh, nursing homes in Washington County. And so I'm gonna zoom by this and of course we'll send out the presentation and and also inspection results of um, of all our nursing homes, but I, I did want to start off, um, and I'll I'll uh, repeat this at the end. But I wanted to make sure that I gave the sites where you can get the information I'm showing today. So um, the first site that you can see, Medicare.gov Care Compare, is really the site that um, the federal government has had to um, let people know when they're making a decision about nursing homes. Um, the quality of those nursing homes. And, and you'll see some of the measures that they um, give out in that, in that um, website. But uh, I think it's a, pretty, it's a pretty good site um, and it's worth going to if you've never been there. 
Um, the other point that I wanted to make is, um, and Louise will do a really good job at that, is the importance of the ombudsman program. And I list here both the uh, website, if somebody needs an advocate for care they're concerned about inside of a nursing home, that could be a resident, it could be a family, it could be a staff person in a nursing home, uh, just a concerned citizen. And um, you have the number there and you also have the uh, website. And then, you know, in, in some ways you hope whenever there's an issue in a nursing home that you could go to the person that you have concerns about. If that fails, you go to the director of nursing or to the administrator and you hope there's responsiveness and the, the issues get worked on. And then if you don't, then that's what's great about the ombudsman is they can support you in advocating to hopefully come up with the resolution that's, you know, it's good for the, the resident and the family and also good for the nursing home. But if all of those things fail or you don't want to go through that full process, I wanted to make sure that um, people had access to the website and the phone number that one would call if you wanted to place a complaint with the state. Um, I also wanted to, and Louise will go into this, but raise the consciousness about the opportunity for residents of Washington County to receive training and serve as volunteers in the long-term care and bloodsman program. You know, the, you'll hear more about Louise um, Yeoman efforts to be the only ombudsman for all of Washington County that includes nursing homes and I believe the other types of housing. And so you can imagine if there were um, train volunteers that could support going in, learning about, you know, what people's issues are, um, how helpful it could be for us to have even a bigger reach and having being some ears and um, eyes for um, residents and families inside the buildings. Um, I, you know, I think another goal for this presentation is just as we start talking about ARPA funds and also millage dollars, if, if it gets passed, is that we, you know, sort of think about that population of residents in, in uh, uh, Washington County, just because um, especially those long stay residents often don't have the voice and are almost the invisible population in the county. And, um, and they often do benefit from the advocacy and, and some support that isn't presently happening uh, under, you know, present funding. Um, I also think that, you know, one of the recommendations, hopefully after, and I know, I don't know if Jason's still on, but that the concept of each commissioner visiting each nursing home in their district unannounced once a year and asking questions of their constituents and family members and staff would really become, I think, something that, you know, could be an important step to both an understanding by the commissioners of what's you know, people's perspective on the nursing homes and also um, you manage what you measure so that if um, a commissioner comes in that if unannounced that, um, you know, facilities are often gonna consider that in um, upping their game. Um, and then the, other, the last thing that you'll hear me, you know, recommend again is just presently, you'll see when you go to that website, Care Compare, that you'll be able to see quality measures like the percent of pressure ulcers, the percentage of people that fell, the readmission rates, things like that. But presently, there is not a standardized satisfaction survey for nursing homes. They have it for home care, they have it for hospitals, lots of other um, regulated settings by the government. But for whatever reason, nursing homes have never had that. Now, I do expect it will happen over the next couple of years. But presently and in the past, there's never been one. And so I think there is an opportunity, in that, whether that's through the ARPA funding, through millage funding, that we might want to consider as a county um, to be able to um, work with one of the universities, or you could work for one of the research groups to consider whether or not we would want to look to have a satisfaction survey done, and then for the results to be posted in a place that might bring together those sur survey answers, um, the Medicare care compare information, the inspection reports, all the things that are out there, but often people don't know about it in 
um, have a hard time navigating. So, um, so I wanted to give you a sense of the care compare site. And you could see that um, th this is tr from the site. It was, I think I made a copy of this like, you know, five days ago, something like that. So you could see, and, um, you know, for example, in Washington County, this is um, a site that is in the special focus facility. So they don't even give the ratings because of the concerns about this specific um, place in Washington County. But you could see the way it works. There's star ratings overall, there's health inspection star ratings, there's staffing ratings, and there's quality measure ratings. And it, as you go into these things, you can go into more detail. Um, I want to show you, um, you know, the other is just to give you a sense of the comparison, not expecting you to remember any of this stuff, but just to give you a sense of the different um, communities here in Washington County. Um, this evangelical home, this red thing basically means that there was a situation in which there was identified abuse. And so that's what that red flag is. Um, and same thing at Regency at Whitmore. So I'm not gonna go into this in detail, just wanted to let you know it's available. And these are actual um, ratings. So you can review that at your leisure. Um, I do wanna mention that some of the things that I guess I would um, care about, especially in the short state population is how often are people getting hospitalized? How often are they going to the emergency room? And unfortunately, the way the residents, the long stay residents report is, it's sort of hard to really understand. So I tried to make it a little simpler, but for long stay residents, and those are people considered living, being in the nursing home for hundred days or more, what this sort of tells you is um, these numbers are what you would see, but these numbers give you, I think, a better sense of how well um, you know, uh, the facility is doing. So for example, for Chelsea Retirement Community, if all of the facilities had 100 long stay beds that were filled, it would be estimated that Chelsea would have 11 less admissions per year for those 100 than what would have been expected by the government. While um, Evangelical for their long stay residents would have had 27 more admissions to the hospital than what would have been expected for those 100 people. So that's what this, this is. And it has the same thing for the emergency room. In regards to the short stay residents, a little simpler because it's just a readmission rate. So I wanted to share, and maybe this is one of my biggest concerns about our opportunities for improvement in Washington County. What this shows is the observed rate. So this is actually what happened. And it shows you that the best of, of all of the nursing home, right? had one out of five people go back to the hospital within 30 days. So you go from the hospital, you go to the nursing home, within 30 days, one out of five people are going back to the hospital and getting admitted in the hospital. And so if you then add the emergency room to that list, so they went, they either, they went to the hospital or they went to the emergency room and they returned back to the to the nursing home. So they didn't they didn't get admitted. You can see that even a place like Chelsea, who had a one out of five to get hospitalized, when you add in the ER, it means that within 30 days, one out of three people have gone back to the hospital to either get admitted or to get um, it, um, or, or get sent home from the ER. And that's generally true. You can see the Villa at Park Ridge three out of 10 people are going to the hospital and you add another 19. So almost half of the people that went to um, Villa Park Ridge have returned back to the hospital within 30 days. Um, we didn't see it with Whitmore Lake, you know, same thing, around half of the people have returned to the hospital within 30 days. So it's one of the things that makes me feel like there's an opportunity for us to get involved and an opportunity for improvement in, in the nursing homes. Um, 
because I think we all should expect better. Um, this tells you, I'm looking at the time, uh, this tells you what happens when people leave. So this score is really a percentage. And what it says is, once somebody leaves the nursing home, 68% of the people that leave the nursing home, so they didn't get readmitted, they went home, 68% of the people um, were able to stay at home without getting sent to the hospital and getting admitted or dying. And so that's what these numbers are. So two out of three are staying at home without any kind of return back to the hospital. On the other hand, at Mission Point, um, you can see that um, only half of the people when they go home, stay at home. It, or, uh, so, you know, this is another number that the government reports out, um, you know, on a quarterly basis. And I'll just mention whenever you see not available, um, not available for Villa Park Ridge had to do with the fact that they were on that special focus list. Not available for Gilbert residents is because the number of people they have is, is low. And so when you have a small number, the government doesn't report it out. Um, and then this is the list of deficiencies, that health deficiencies in, in 21 and 22 combined. Um, and so you can get a sense of how many deficiencies each one of these places are. Overall for the for Washington County, it, um, there were 283 health deficiencies between um, calendar year 21 and 22 year to date. Um, I'm not gonna go into this, but I did, in the slides you get, you're gonna see the actual deficiencies that each of the retirement communities had. Um, and, and you know, of course, the ones that have more, the letters are a lot smaller, but you know, when you when you see it on your slide, you'll be able to read it. Um, and and you know, again, opportunity for improvement in each one of the facilities. Um, so you know, getting back and finishing up, um, like I said, really important for people to know about the care care site. Really important to know about the ombudsman site. Really important for people to know how to complain. Um, think about how do we publicize a volunteer program? So Louise has some colleagues. Um, let's make sure we think about um, the nursing homes and, and assisted. We didn't have enough time to, to talk about assisted living. It's less regulated. So that's, um, unfortunately, there's less information about assisted living, but definitely that and adult foster care and homes for the ages are also opportunities for us to to really get a better understanding of what's happening inside those buildings. Um, mentioned about the idea of a commissioner visit and us maybe holding the commissioners accountable for such visits. And then um, something to consider for opera or millage funding is um, a satisfaction survey that could be used so people can get better information because especially in a long stay resident and maybe for the short stay as well that it would be nice to have more understanding of the quality of the care and the quality of the life of residents who are likely to spend the rest of their life in the in that nursing home. And presently, it's very hard to get their voice out. And so the idea that we could ask residents and family members and if for it to be known so others making the decision would, would have information available to be more informed would be something I think worthwhile. So with that, I want to pass the baton to- uh, I actually Lisa. have two questions. Oh, okay. uh, can we sure. stop for a moment to do a couple questions? Okay. So my first question, um, you know, you mentioned commissioners walking into nursing homes and talking to some of their residents and constituents. Do nursing home residents, like do, does their residency then become the nursing home? address or do they maintain their home address? So I, I believe that, for, I, I, I don't know, I want to say this is to the best of my knowledge, but I think it mm -hmm. should be confirmed that the short stay resident would maintain their address because the thought is most of those residents will be going home. 
The long stay resident is again, it, it's not a, I think you'd have to ask someone else, but, but the long stay resident, I think the expectation is they'll likely be there for the rest of their life. So that mm -hmm. does become their address. I don't know, Margie, of course, is another uh, expert in, in and has done a lot of work in nursing homes. I don't know if, uh, Margie, you have any more insight well, into that. It's, it's been my, what you described as experience uh, as I've followed a, a, several patients in nursing homes as their advocate. And <clears throat> I think that a family can, um, even in the long stay, can have their legal address be their, their prior residence or, you know, so that mail goes to them. But, um, but generally, and when they get into long stay, it becomes the address of the facility. You know, there's been a so, to go like have um, vote, make sure that nursing home residents vote. Yeah. But I don't know. Again, that might not necessarily say that that's because their residence is the nursing home, but um, mm -hmm. so I don't want to jump to that conclusion. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. Um, the other question that I had, and this is probably not something that you have like access to right now, but I would be interested in doing some dating mining with you on this, but for the safe discharge slide that you had, mm -hmm. I just wondered if, if like you tend to find in your experience that age-friendly counties or communities have higher discharge rates overall, or if nursing homes tend to stay independent from some of the other county interest. Um, yeah. I I would say um, this is not related to the data. This is just my own experience okay. you know, in, in my career. Um, there are great opportunities for improvement for the engagement of community resources um, mm -hmm. in regards to nursing home residents who are leaving. Um, there's, despite the fact there should be a lot more timing in regards to discharge planning, um, there still seems to be a sort of a stressful, oh, we, you know, this person's ready for discharge. And so um, it's still somewhat rushed. I think the one area that has shown some improvement and others, and I'm sure can share more about it, is for those who qualify for the home and community-based waiver program, that if, unless things have changed, they do go to the top of the priority list as a, as a person who would jump the, the list um, mm -hmm. because of the fact that they're in the nursing home setting and you are able to move them back to the community. Um, so that's good, you know, because once you're connected to the area and age and you're much more likely to get that kind of support. But um, yeah, so I, I, I would say there's opportunity, there's opportunity not only in regards to community resources and, them, and people getting access to that in a timely way, but even in home care that I, I would say that right. it, it's shocking to the number of people that get discharged from the nursing home to home after a stay that, you know, in which they had either cognitive or physical issues and yet still go home without home care. So mm -hmm. yeah, lots of, lots of opportunity. Louise, I'm sure can comment on that as well. I don't know if you wanna do that now from your own experience. Or jump into your presentation. That feels like a really smooth handoff. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> okay. By the way, while she's doing it, thankfully I've had a lot of conversations with Louise over the last month and we shall thank her immensely for, she's just so passionate about the work she does. We're very lucky to have some <laughs> Louise that's representing our older adults in, in our facilities. Stephanie, should I have the, should I have this open on my computer? Um, you can share like how we did it the, before the meeting started or I can share uh, your slides for you if you prefer, either way. Okay, I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing it on the, okay, let me, maybe I'm not, no. Yes, you're sharing not. your whole screen now. <laughs> I know. Okay. 
Okay, let me let me let me try that again. And all I'm seeing when I share screen right now is my um is my computer. So let me if you go back, Louise, if you go back to where you were when you could see your full screen, mm -hmm. then then just go to the PowerPoint and the PowerPoint will show up for us. Okay. Tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna just open up the PowerPoint because I don't know how to do all that. Yeah, if you open so open the PowerPoint on your computer and then just share the screen like you were just doing, and then um we'll see the PowerPoint. Because we'll okay. see what, whatever's on your screen. So if you have the PowerPoint open, we'll be able to see that. Okay. You know, Steve, um, I really appreciate your the information you gave us. Um, and I, like I said, I've I've had several patients in various um rehab and long-term care and short-term care, um, several friends where I'm advocate for them. Um, and it has been an extremely frustrating experience over and over again. And I'm a healthcare worker, so I should know how to jump over some of those hurdles, but many of them are just not jumpable. <laughs> and, um, so I appreciate the topic and, and I appreciate what you um, presented. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think, I think uh, raising consciousness is important uh, because yeah. of the invisibility of older adults who are there to most in the community. Um, and so, yeah, we just got to figure, I think, you know, Marie challenged us is to think about how can we make a difference? You know, what are those opportunities? And um, I think that volunteer mm -hmm. program seems like one opportunity if we could um, get a big force and then also for us and service providers to be able to get the information out like the ones that I'm sharing. Yeah. And here we go. All right. Um, how do I make it full screen though? Look on the bottom on the right, it should have a picture of like a screen. There you go. Yeah, right there. Yep. This. Yep, that one. <laughs> okay. Got it. So um Mary, Mary is here with me in spirit. She was supposed to do this presentation with me, but uh she's not here. My name is Louise Brebecki at I am. Uh, long-term care ombudsman for uh, Washtenaw County and a few others. Um, and I've been doing this work now for almost 10 years. And um, I enjoy the work, otherwise I couldn't do it. Um, so that being said, um, the ombudsman program was, was um, originally started back in 1972 under um, Nixon's eight point initiative to improve nursing home care. Because as we all know, nursing home care was pretty atrocious back in the 60s and 70s and, and, um, <clears throat> and that. And today nursing homes exist in all states, uh, District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, Guam, and um, and we fall under the authorization of the Older Americans Act. Um, each state has an office uh, for the long-term care ombudsman. 
um, and there is a state long-term care ombudsman, and for us, that is, uh, her name is Sally Pong, and she sits in Lansing, but you'll see her. She, she's always out and about because there's just not enough of us. Um, who does the work? Uh, the state office usually has, uh, you know, two to three employees. There are approximately 20 local um, ombudsmen across the state, and that's definitely not enough. Um, we usually have about uh, 32 volunteers, um, and, and these numbers were pre-COVID, the 32 volunteers. Right now, we do not have 32 volunteers. A lot of our volunteers um, actually um, stopped and um, and did not come back uh, after COVID. Um, the work is done in uh, approximately, these numbers are, are all approximate because we all know that um, nursing homes are popping up all the time. Um, so there's more than 460 now, you know, some have opened, some have closed, but, but uh, there are new nursing homes around about approximately 460 nursing homes across the state serving um, 48,000 residents. Um, there's approximately um, 4,500 adult foster care homes and homes for the aged serving approximately 53,000 people, residents. In Washtenaw County, currently there are nine nursing homes uh, with a total of 1,061 beds, um, caring for on average um, 753 residents daily. Um, other long-term care facilities, um, there are, and these are all approximate numbers because um, for adult foster care homes, these are just, just the licensed ones. Okay, so there are approximately 94 licensed adult foster care homes with 704 beds. And there are, and we know this, this 13 homes for the aged, that's a low number because that number should include homes for the aged plus assisted living facilities um, and, and some of the memory care units that are popping up all, you know, all the time now. Um, but they're saying approximately um, 1,100 beds for that. And that this is just in, in Washington County. Um, I, uh, am hired by uh, Area Agency on Aging 1B. Uh, they house the long-term care on pro ombudsman program. And in Region 1B, we cover six counties. There are three ombudsmen that cover approximately 105 nursing homes. So um, Elaine Hearns, she's one of the ombudsmen. Um, she covered Macomb and St. Clair. Mary Catsarellis cover Oakland. I cover Livingston, Monroe, part of Oakland, and Washtenaw. And we, we uh, monitor approximately 35 nursing homes each. Um, our goal as ombudsman, we try to focus on resident rights and the quality of life in the nursing home. Um, we support residents in self-advocacy and we seek systemic change to improve the outcomes. Um, what we do is um, we, we collaborate and support with facilities, um, and reaching shared goals. So, which means that although my, my job is to advocate for the resident, I have to always work with the facilities to get the job done. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of a middle person, if you will. Um, so I have to work creatively 
and try to be a part of the solution. Um, we serve as, um, as a resource and working with families and responsible parties, which means that there are many people in the nursing home who cannot um, speak for themselves. So we have to work with families and responsible parties, meaning um, POAs and guardians and, and family members. Um, and we have to be a neutral third party. And like I said, obligated to advocate for the resident's wishes. Um, so this slide here kind of, uh, this changed shortly before the pandemic, which gave us access to residents pretty much 24 hours a day. Okay, we can, we can, we can, you know, if, if there's something going on and they need us, we have access and we can get into the facilities 24 hours a day. Okay. Um, our program, uh, we work as an oversight agency and we are not subject to HIPAA, but Ombudsman must, must adhere to a strict confidentiality and cannot disclose information without the resident's consent, with few exceptions. I know there's going to be questions about that, um, including reports of abuse, neglect, or exploitation. Um, we act on behalf of the resident. Um, New regulations allow for ombudsmen to act on behalf of the resident in limited situations with state ombudsman approval. So if there is a, that's just saying that if there is a, um, an allegation of abuse or neglect um, and we can act, uh, kind of override what the resident wants if we see that, it, you know, it's just, it's just beyond, um, you know, there's some things you just can't not see. So um, if we see things like that, then we are obligated to, to report those things. Um, and we, as ombudsman, we work under a strict conflict of interest um, rule. So um, what do we do? We promote high quality of care and quality of life. Um, we um, make sure residents know their rights and, um, and make sure the families know their rights. We empower residents to commun communicate their concerns. We assist residents in resolving their concerns. Um, we provide education on long-term care issues. Um, we promote the use of best practices, advocate for residents and their families, um, and we try to inform systemic change through state and federal advocacy. Um, we visit the homes. We have to visit, like I said earlier, I have 35 homes and we, we have, we're supposed to visit all 35 homes each quarter. Okay, um, that's the goal is to 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 at, to visit those homes quarterly, and just to just so that we are visible to the residents. Residents know us, um, so that when we do visit a, a facility, you know they know who the ombudsman are. You know some of them. Not that's not to say that all of them do. Um, most people do have to hunt us down in the community. We are, as one family member put it, we are the best kept secret. Okay, because when you get in trouble in a nursing home, sometimes people just don't know who to call or where to go. So um, uh, we do try to visit the nursing homes quarterly. Um, we we are notified of complaint surveys and involuntary discharges by the state survey agency um, generating cases for us. Uh, we do detail work. Uh, our detail work is maintained in a um, um, a state 
documentation uh, program called Well Sky, and we do keep strict confidentiality. Okay, we must have the resident's consent, the resident or the resident's representative. And this number here, this 866 number, you can call this number uh, from anywhere and it is geo-routed to, if you call from Ann Arbor with an Ann Arbor um, area code, that number will come directly, it, that call will come directly to me no matter where you are. Okay, so, um, and it's like that for all the other, it, all the numbers are geo-routed to whatever county you're calling from. Um, and these are old numbers, so it's it's really, you know, these, uh, but some things don't change, okay? Um, we're still doing all the same stuff. Top issues are, are still residence rights, uh, abuse, neglect, and exploitation. 91% um, of complaints are made against a nursing home. Nine are made against adult foster care homes and homes for the, for the ages. Um, and we get 16, uh, more than that, that many cases are open now, especially during COVID and pre-COVID, we, we probably had more cases open during that time than we have ever had. So, like I said, these numbers are old, um, but this is, this is what we had on, on the, um, on this on this presentation and they haven't really updated all those numbers yet um but our top complaint issues are involuntary discharges and evictions um uh failure to respond for requests for help that's when people are in the nursing home and they put their light on and they may have to wait you know a uh, lack of dignity and respect of the resident uh medication administration mistakes uh, and requests for a less restrictive setting. Those are the top complaint issues that we get. Um, we, we do have lots of successes in the nursing homes. We resolve payment issues to, to avoid involuntary discharges. We help residents revoke court-appointed guardians and um, educate staff on the appropriate use of guardianships. Um, we um, clarify the authority of a durable power of attorney for staff impacting practices to support residents' choice. And we connect residents with legal support to avoid involuntary discharges. This is just a case example, um, but, and we don't, we don't have to go through that. Uh, you guys can read that on your, you know, on your own time. Uh, if you want to uh, go through it. Um, so, and you guys can ask me questions if you have questions about anything that I've pretty much, um, anything that you've said here. And I'm going to stop sharing. Are there any questions? Elizabeth. I have one. Um, I can't. Elizabeth has her Margie. hand up. I'm going to let Elizabeth go and then you're up next, Margie. Okay. Um, the subject of the long-term care ombudsman program is something really close to my heart. My mom, Jean Thompson, was uh, involved on the federal and state level in back in the late 60s and early 70s in bringing the program to Michigan after helping get the federal legislation authorized and through Citizens for Better Care, which was the first agency dealing with the long-term mm -hmm. care ombudsman. So it, it's lovely to hear <laughs> how her work has continued. Um, I think the power of having citizens go into a facility and see and talk to people is unmatched. You can have all the regulation on paper that you like, mm -hmm. but 
people have to go into a place and talk to people to to get change to happen. Mm -hmm. I also think it's especially powerful these days because while we can have all the tools about selection of places we like, especially post COVID, mm -hmm. uh, the options that are even available for a family to choose are so limited. Um, many facilities even now don't have the staff to even open all the beds that they physically have. Mm -hmm. So I think the focus on trying to recruit volunteers to participate as part of those eyes and ideas is a wonderful suggestion, Steve. Um, we're, the county isn't really involved in terms of funding streams or regulatory streams that comes from the federal government and the state, but where we are involved in is the people who live here. So I just like to say, I love the idea of the commission publicizing the ability for residents of our county to truly assist other residents. I think that might be something we might want to mm -hmm. consider as we talk about, um, improving the quality for life. That, that both has a tangible effect in terms of improving care, quality of care, but also begins to make connections that aren't always there between people in the community and residents in a facility. Thank you so much for the work you do and for your presentation. You're welcome. Um, am Are I you? up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, a, a comment and a couple of questions. The comment is the person who said you were the best well-kept secret is right on, on spot on. Um, yeah. As long as I've been involved in nursing home boards and caring for people, I, I did not know this. And, wow. um, and I'm wondering how that could be better um, communicated. Um, but the, 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 question, the question I have is, could you just briefly explain to, to, those, to us at what um, Home for the Age it is as opposed to, to nursing homes? Homes for the Age are, are, are typically um, uh, private pay facilities. Nursing homes are, nursing homes can be private pay too, but they, they also, um, you can be on Medicaid. Yeah. Um, homes for the aged usually do not accept Medicaid. There are a few who will um, accept like the uh, waiver, the, you know, like the waiver program um, mm -hmm. where they will subsidize a person being in an assisted living or home for the aged but very, very few. Those are few and far between, okay? But nursing homes, all, almost always nursing homes um, um, have uh, like, uh, you know, you can go on Medicaid. Yeah. Okay. And are homes for the aged typically like smaller group homes in a like a, a retrofitted house? Mm, no. no, homes for the aged are more like assisted living, you know, like the Brookdales and the and the oh, university livings and the, not like those, Memory Lane. Not like Memory Lane. Memory Lane is more of a um of an adult foster care home, or yeah. it falls under that. It falls okay. under that umbrella. You. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, your hand is up. Well, wait, I had one other question. Oh yeah, go for it. Go for it. Yes. Um, yes. So I'm a say I'm um, a family member and I file a complaint with the state. Mm -hmm. How do you come into that, if at all? Um, and would it be more appropriate to contact you or the state? Well, you can do both. Um, the state has 
the state survey surveyors have typically now started asking family members when they call when they get a complaint did you did you talk to your ombudsman yeah okay mm -hmm. so um they pretty much kind of throw us under the bus when it comes to that and you know but um but i guess it's it, it's it's kind of a good question though because we can we can help solve a lot of problems before they get before people have to call the state yeah. okay um and 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 you know when it comes to calling the state or calling us the nursing homes would much rather you call us first <laughs> i'm sure okay yes so um because we can't give them a citation but the state can yeah so so you would typically call the ombudsman if you have a loved one in a nursing home and you're having uh issues with care or whatever that you can't solve yourself you would typically call the ombudsman and every nursing home is supposed to have uh we we give out posters every year uh we we leave and when we visit these facilities quarterly we're leaving information we're leaving flyers we're leaving stuff there cards you know but typically somebody's going right behind us picking that stuff up and yeah <laughs> filing it yes so so and then the posters you know we we get pushback about the posters we get you know so if the poster is if the poster is not up because the poster has the 866 number on it mm -hmm. okay so that poster should be up in every nursing home but it's not yeah 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 well you are a, a well-kept secret okay <laughs> And you mentioned that you were an advocate, um, Margaret, in the nursing homes or, or uh, yeah. around Washtenaw County. Maybe we should connect so that, you know, maybe I can get you some information and you can hand out information also as you go on around your way. Well, actually, I'm done with that. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, yeah. that was in the past. I, okay. Yeah, I'm very right. interested in this topic because it has been a real source of frustration for me okay gotcha gotcha okay yeah thank you you're welcome hey stephanie in just a moment i want to move to triple a one b's presentation so if you could move katie to the panelists that would be that'd be great steven your hand is up yeah uh just a few things one is uh i want to thank elizabeth um mom for what she has done because Citizens for Better Care and then all the that has followed has been such an important advocacy for a population that really needed CBC. Um, and, you know, been here for too long in the field of geriatrics and just know how powerful CBC was in regards to affecting mm -hmm. um, care even way before even, you know, others um, thought about the issue. So you should be very proud. I'm sure you are. Um, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention in regards to, um, service providers, since I know that a whole bunch of our attendees are service providers, I mean, that's our other opportunity, right? Is that every touch that older adults have, it's an opportunity to educate and to let them know about the information that's available, that the ombudsman is available, the complaint line. So I am hoping that anyone on the you know, is attending this will also do what they can in their role to get the information out and to, to support people in this way, because um, it, it's unfortunately we're making very quick decisions when people are in the hospital and going to a nursing home. And the more information we could somehow get to them in a timely way would be really important. Um, assisted living, you know, we're not talking about that today, but I will say that, you know, as an older person who now has a lot of friends who have people in assisted living, lots of opportunity for improvement there, less information about what's happening in there. Um, and I, I think that's another opportunity in the future for the council to, or the commission on aging to look at because mm -hmm. it's such a unregulated 
invisible type of setting, again, with no real place to go for satisfaction surveys, which would be really critical, you know, to be able right. to make informed decisions. Um, and then the final thing is that I thought about after writing up the presentation is we are fortunate to have so many universities in here between U of M, EMU, um, WCC, you know, it's, it's amazing. And the opportunity to have students um, potentially get involved in the nursing homes in so many different ways, whether it's just sit, you know, someone to just talk to the residents or get trained as a CNA for a job even, you know, there's just a lot of opportunities that hopefully would grow the field of gerontology and geriatrics. So, you know, that's another opportunity maybe as we think about opera and millage funds, is there an opportunity like that to organize, you know, such an effort to get students involved to, to support this population? So with that. Well, thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Louise, for um, your work putting those presentations together and, and sharing those, those action steps for us. It's been very enlightening. Um, I do want to move us to our next presentation. We have Katie Wendell from the Area Agency on Aging. She is the Director of Planning and Advocacy. Uh, we thought, well, when we had um, Louise scheduled to come, we realized that we have not, we've heard from AAA1B and we have Stephanie here from AAA1B, but we actually haven't had a presentation on, on all the things AAA1B has to offer, including um, that ombudsman program. So um, Katie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. You're muted. There we go. I got the presentation going, I think, but then I yes. lost my unmute button in the process. <laughs> um, but can you all see the presentation right now? Yes, we can. Great. Okay. Um, technology. Um, thank you for the introduction, Marie. I'm Katie Wendell, Director of Planning and Advocacy at the Area Agency on Aging 1B. Um, it's great to be here with all of you. Uh, this is my first week back from maternity leave. So if I am rusty, I ask Stephanie and uh, Amanda Sears is uh, participating as well. They can jump in and um, remind me of anything I miss as I go through this. Um, you know, just as Marie said, you know, we've worked with you all before. You've seen more of our research, um, planning and advocacy kind of functions uh, as the agency. But of course, um, really what most of uh, you know, the staff at our agency is working on is like, uh, providing services uh, to older adults and supporting uh, the aging network uh, in Washtenaw County. So uh, this is more of our general community presentation that we give to senior groups um, and things like that. So uh, with that, I'll jump in, figure out how to advance slides. Here we go. Uh, so area agencies on aging uh, were created by an act of Congress in 1974 called the Older Americans Act. Um, we're a national network um, of area agencies on aging. So there's over 600 in the United States. So a great you know, takeaway if you're working with loved ones in other states um, that you know, might be experiencing some issues identifying uh, resources for long-term care or uh, nutrition and the like. Uh, they can look up their local area agency on aging. Uh, each one of us does things a little differently. Uh, the Older Americans Act designs area agencies on aging to be responsive to the needs of our local communities. So uh, we have some discretion and variance in how we uh, meet the needs of older adults and family caregivers in the area we serve. So there'll, there'll be some differences in the programs and services offered but generally we're all focused on supporting older adults and their families uh, in aging in place at home. Um, the, things like the nutrition program, nutrition program are uh, pretty universal. Uh, we all have our designated geographic areas. Um, the Area Agency on Aging 1B serves a six county region here in Southeast Michigan, uh, Livingston, Macomb, Monroe, Oakland, St. Clair, and of course, Washtenaw County. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization with a wide range of programs and services. And the services you associate with us um, are kind of provided in two ways. There are some programs that we offer directly uh, that 
you know, area agency on aging one B staff are the ones providing the program and you work directly with us. There's also programs and services that we fund. Um, you know, we support local organizations uh, in the community that are actually providing the service. Um, so area agency programs will be carried out in both of those ways. So sometimes you'll be more familiar with a local organization uh, that we uh, provide a grant to, to do work. Um, and just because of our, um, you know, the close proximity of our neighbors, we like to include that uh, Wayne County is served by two separate area agencies on aging. Uh, so there's the Detroit Area Agency on Aging or DAAA uh, that serves the city of Detroit uh, and the Senior Alliance which serves uh, Western Wayne County. So uh, if you are uh, looking for those resources, we, we commonly refer to one another because, um, you know, a little bit of a geographic mix up there. So um, that's where the 1A, B, and C come in. Uh, the primary way that you access programs and services from the Area Agency on Aging 1B is contacting our Information and Assistance Center. Um, so the, our 1-800 number is on the slide right here. Uh, this is a free uh, phone-based uh, service for anyone to call to get information about programs, services, resources. Our information and assistance staff are well-versed, not only in the programs that we provide and fund, but also the, the full range of long-term care options. So if you aren't sure what, what program or service might be the best fit for you, our information and assistance staff can provide some unbiased uh, information to help you navigate long-term care options and figure out what programs and services might be available in your area. Um, again, including things that aren't directly funded by uh, the Area Agency on Aging. So really a, a great resource that I hope you're able to utilize uh, if you have any questions. They're who I call <laughs> when uh, I'm in the community and someone has a question about how could I get support getting a ramp um, in this community and, and they can pull that list of resources uh, and mail them directly to you if, that, if that's the support you need. Uh, some of our, our key programs are in-home care programs. So we offer two uh, government-funded programs that can provide care in the home. Uh, the first is the My Choice Medicaid Waiver Program. Um, there's another slide on this. I'll get into a bit more detail. And then also our Community Living Program. So My Choice is a Medicaid program. Our Community Living Program is funded with Older Americans Act funds. So it's not a Medicaid program, uh, which means that there's not a specific income cutoff. Um, of course, in-home service programs are in really high demand. So our Community Living Program you can provide in-home uh, supportive services, but there is quite a long wait list uh, for the non-Medicaid program. Uh, the community living program uh, does prioritize uh, who receives service based, based on need. So it's not just a first come first serve type wait list. Um, if you have really high uh, needs for support with activities of daily living, you don't have a lot of other family support and are, are lower income, you'll rise to the top of that wait list uh, faster. So uh, a little bit more about the Med My Choice Medicaid Waiver Program. I was mentioned a little bit in the last pre presentation as well. Uh, this is a program that's an alternative to nursing home care. Individuals that are eligible for the My Choice Medicaid Waiver Program have to meet um, what's called a nursing facility level of care. They have to have uh, fairly significant uh, care needs, limitations with uh, activities of daily living, uh, and re require support to live independently. Um, and we provide that care in the home, um, in often in supplement to what family caregivers are providing. Uh, and then there also is financial eligibility guidelines uh, for Medicaid programs. Um, so that current amount is uh, about $2,500 or less in monthly income. And there is also an asset uh, limit too. With There's a couple exclusions um, to that. So um, if you're interested in the program, again, talk to our information and assistance program and they can uh, help you understand the eligibility in a bit more detail. 
uh, some of the services that the My Choice program provides includes um, personal care, homemaking, uh, and respite for family caregivers. Um, it could include the personal emergency response button, um, the uh, kind of like the life alert type service, um, transportation to your um, medical appointments, and also just community-based transportation, meals, chore service. So a really comprehensive program that enables individuals to remain living in their homes and communities. Um, another program that we're, um, area agencies generally are known for are home delivered meals. Um, so that is a hot lunch every weekday, um, daily check-in uh, at your door, um, a really great service to, again, support individuals living in the community. So eligibility for that program, um, just have to be over the age of 60 and then uh, unable to leave your home without assistance. Again, that's a program that we work with local community providers. Our MMAP program or the uh, Medicare Medicaid Assistance Program provides free and unbiased uh, information about navigating Medicare and Medicaid. A really valuable program if um, you've ever utilized it. Uh, they provide both just general education about Medicare, like Medicare ABCs to help you um, when you're first turning 65, understand your options uh, and select a plan that works best for you and make sure you're um, checking all of your boxes in that enrollment process because it can be quite daunting and complicated. They also provide support during open enrollment, which begins on October 15th. Um, every year, Medicare beneficiaries should be checking their plans to make sure it's still the best fit for them. So our uh, MMAP counselors, a mix of staff and uh, trained volunteers, you can submit your medication list, um, some of your preferred providers, and uh, they can help you view plans, see your options, and what might be the most cost-effective uh, option for you. I also should note, uh, if you're interested in support during open enrollment, um, that is, of course, their busiest time of year, um, so do call and uh, secure an appointment if you're interested in that support. Um, we have the My Ride 2 program, uh, which is focused on transportation and understanding mobility options. So we don't directly provide transportation through this program. What the My Ride 2 program specializes in, say, I need to get from A to B, and I'm not quite sure how to do it. Maybe you need uh, some kind of assisted transportation or accessible um, you know, with a wheelchair or uh, something like that they can uh, look at the whole range of options that might be available in your community, generally what the cost is and help you set up that ride. Uh, they also provide some travel training. So if you need to utilize uh, public transportation and maybe you haven't done that before, uh, they can help you navigate those systems so you can be a confident uh, user of the public transportation system. Uh, that program specifically serves Macomb, Oakland, Wayne, and Washtenaw counties. Um, so again, it can help you navigate public transportation, private pay options, um, including things like Lyft. We offer a range of health and wellness classes. Um, many are still being offered virtually, but some classes are now in person. And these bring together small groups of individuals um, for a six to 10 week class, depending on the um, what specific topic uh, on kind of a, a, a range of offerings. Uh, some more detail on this next slide, so I'll skip ahead. Uh, one program is the Aging Mastery Program. Each week of this program focuses on kind of a different domain relevant to aging well. So um, financial and health and helps uh, participants select goals and um, you know, make a plan to improve those different aspects of uh, life. Um, the Matter of Balance program is a falls prevention class that we offer. Uh, and then we have a number of uh, PATH classes or personal actions towards health. Uh, these are chronic disease self-management programs. Uh, so these are focused more on a specific uh, diagnosis many times or um, issues. So we have a chronic pain class, um, we have a diabetes class, and they can help you uh, learn tools to manage those conditions. 
successfully. Also in connecting with peers that are experiencing similar issues. Um, we also provide support for family caregivers. So um, one of those tools is our powerful tools for caregivers class. Um, this is a six week workshop um, that provides education and support for family caregivers. You know, we, we have some of these in-home service programs that we talked about. Um, most care at home is happening because of the support of family caregivers. So it's really important to us that those family caregivers are supported, um, learn how to avoid burnout because they're, they're really um, providing the bulk of care for older adults in our communities. Uh, we also have a caregiver coaching program. This is a relatively new program for the Area Agency on Aging 1B. Uh, and this is a program that uh, provides trained volunteers. So it's also, it's a volunteer opportunity if anyone's interested in that. Um, we train volunteers to provide support directly to family caregivers. So kind of a one-on-one -on -one relationship where family caregivers uh, can ask questions, um, you know, get some emotional support, uh, assistance with resources through their connection with a trained caregiver coach. So we're um, accepting both family caregivers that might want that support and volunteers for that program. Of course, you already heard about our long-term care ombudsman, so I won't talk about that um, because Louise did a, a great job reviewing that. Um, so with that, the, the main thing I, I hope to convey in this presentation is if you need resources, um, you know, interested what might be out there, give us a call. Um, and our information assistance staff can provide a range of options for you. Um, of course, we didn't cover everything the area agency does in this presentation, um, but wanted to be mindful of time too. So with that, uh, I'd like to open it up for any questions you might have. I see Elizabeth's hand. Yeah. Oh. Katie, one of the things that keeps coming up both in um, Marta reported our chair in her presentations to senior centers and we've heard in uh, throughout our meetings is people saying they don't understand what resources are out there. They didn't know what resources are out there and a feeling that the um, online directories or things that are technology-based are not helpful. They wanna to talk to a real person. So would you say that you think that um, your information assistance folks have the capacity to really meet that need if more people knew about you? Yeah, so uh, right now, actually, we've had unprecedented call volume to our, uh, Information and a service, uh, information and assistance um, center. And Amanda, Stephanie, correct me if I'm wrong. I think I saw over like 4,500 calls a month. I think is where we are right now. Um, really, an incredible volume, which is great because that means people are hearing about us and connecting. Um, and we do our best to answer calls live. Um, sometimes there is a bit of a wait time associated with that when the call volume has increased that much. Um, so I guess, yes, but we do ask for a bit of patience because at some peak times there, there can be um, a wait time. I don't have that stat um, right in front of me, but we're working. Our goal is always to answer calls live and you are going to talk with a real person. Um, you know, it's not that that's not how we're set up to you know just leave a message or something like that but there are times where that can happen because um we're seeing a higher call volume than we've ever had before um, so but we're also out in the community willing to do outreach presentations so if there's a specific group that um really is needing that oh we're uh you know interested in in connecting with them too yeah, and um, you have a resource guide book as well. It's not a person, but you have a pretty robust book, right? Yeah, it's um, the resource guide. Um, I can drop the link in the chat, or I guess there's not a chat on this one, is there? Um, Stephanie can send out a link to that too. Um, and we will be updating that uh, in early 2023 is our goal. So um, it's a great resource book 
quite hefty, <laughs> but at the, the back there are county based resource lists. So there's specific Washtenaw County resources in that guide. Wonderful. Steven, your hands up. Um, yeah, so first, uh, really excellent presentation, very comprehensive, learned a lot. And uh, so thank you, Katie, and thanks for, of course, all the area gen aging when B does. Um, one question I had was about the actual office. So that, um, as I remember, there used to be an office in Washtenaw County, and there isn't anymore. Is that accurate? And if so, is there any opportunity to reevaluate that, even if it's just, you know, a, a office inside of a Jewish Family Services or Catholic Social Services? Because I think there is something that was mentioned earlier to being able to go somewhere and speak to somebody in person, uh, especially when we're talking about older adults who some are uncomfortable with the technology. Um. I see Amanda popped up. Uh, yes, that, that is correct, that we um, used to have a number of satellite offices um, in, in several counties, actually, that uh, we made the decision several years ago to um, you know, consolidate down into our, just our main office, part because of utilization. Um, with advances in technology, we have community-based staff um, that, especially in our clinical programs, that you know, visit participants in their homes. Uh, and things like that. And, you know, so there's a lot of staff that work in the community and don't come to any office. It used to be more, really was our clinical staff that were utilizing those remote offices to come and plug in um, for technology purposes, but they're, they're still active in the community without having that particular hub. Um, but I'll certainly pass on that feedback. Um, most of our organization has um, continued to work in kind of a hybrid model um, through the pandemic too. So, uh, but Stephanie or Amanda, if you want to jump in with that too. Yeah. One other thing I wanted to add is we did have a space after we closed our office, um, that was in the Ann Arbor Center for Independent Living. We had, we were an affiliate member at New Center, um, for several years, like ever since that closed, um, and we didn't have an actual office there, but we could reserve, you know, conference room space, they had several spaces that we could reserve as needed. Um, we didn't, we used it for meetings um, somewhat often. Uh, we didn't really ever have, it was open to anybody from our agency to use if they wanted to meet with anyone. Um, I don't believe that anybody uh, besides our team for meetings ever actually used the space. Um, we still found it valuable, but then during COVID, you know, I think a year into COVID, we decided to to end that just because we weren't using it and we didn't know what would happen and we could join again. So I just wanted to. I, wonder, that. I was just going to say, I wonder if there's not the possibility of even just office hours that mm -hmm. you know, if everyone knew that you know Monday from you know I don't know three to five or two to five at either, you know, the Ann Arbor Library or the Ypsilanti Library or at the Ann Arbor Community Foundation, you know, if we can get that word out to the people actually do come and yeah. I think, I mean, again, COVID changed everything, but hopefully we're, we're getting to a point where with everyone vaccinated that people will be a little bit more comfortable doing something like that. Yeah, and that was another thing that our, uh, Resource Information and Assistance Resource Center was doing. Um, we actually started in Washington and then it was successful. So we started branching out to other communities where our resource specialists would um, start to have office hours at different senior centers. Um, and I don't like to blame COVID. It was just that kind of stopped because nobody was meeting in person. And I'm not sure where they're at with you know, going back to starting that up, but I know it's definitely on the radar because there was interest and it was helpful to just be able to have hours to help people in person. And then, you know, the, um, we talked about nursing homes earlier. You know, it's a, it's another thing. If, uh, if maybe family members and residents knew of office hours by the area and it's aging, you know, would you find that what... Um, uh, Maria was asking about, which is engagement of community resources. Would that happen more if there was a regular presence of the area agency on aging? 
and people getting knowledge about it. Yeah, thank you. I'll I'll pass along um, that feedback, and you know, we um, as we as the world, I don't know, comes to a a new place of engagement. I, I don't know if you can call it normal or not. Uh, that some of those things we you know we should be thinking about and revisiting, and um, yeah, but you know, it's always our goal to stay connected uh, in our community. So if there's, um, you know, a place that we should be and we're not, um, you know, we want that feedback. So we, we make sure that everyone can access our resources. So our communications team is, um, you know, going out to senior centers and doing presentations similar to this one, uh, and also attending, you know, any resource fairs and things like that. Um, you know, you all are well connected. So if there's, there's anything like that going on, please do let us know. We'd like to to be engaged in those opportunities. Now, if, if no one has another question, one quick question. We are talking about assisted living and the lack of information about the different choices one could make for, you know, a loved one or for themselves. And I was wondering if, if somebody called the Air Agency on Aging and they were asking about, you know, quality of the care and the and quality of life of the residents in assisted living. How does how does the area agency and on aging answer that kind of question? So our tools will be similar to what you looked at um, in your you know, nursing home research. So, like for a traditional nursing home, you know, we could ref, you know direct you to those star ratings and things like that. For assisted living, where those aren't. As readily available. Um, you know, we don't necessarily have an alternative tool. We do have um, some lists of questions to ask. Um, it's part of actually our, what's in our Connect resource guide too is um, you know, whether you're hiring private assistance like with a you know, personal care aid um, or you know, entering the, just kind of a checklist of um, things to, to consider when you're you know, selecting some of those private pay options. So it's not like we have a you know, any kind of review database, but we can give you our best advice on how to navigate. Um, and, you know, that might include asking around in your community for, you know, what others' experiences have been with a particular option. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much, Katie and Amanda, um, for coming and talking with us about all the programs you offer. Um, I'm going to move on to the report from the chair. I have a couple of notes from Marta. And the first one um, related to this presentation, too, was that, you know, she went to speak to the Ypsilanti Senior Center about the Commission on Aging. And um, amongst other things, they were talking about some barriers. And one of the main issues that were discussed with the members was the inability to get information available. Um, I'm sorry, the information about services for seniors. Um, and then they stressed that they wanted a central location for getting that information and having a live human being to talk to. And so remembering that we have AAA 1B as a resource um, with their information referral center, they'll get them to Jewish Family Services if that's where they need to, to be for what they're looking for. They'll get them to the senior center if that's what they're looking for, transportation if that's what they're looking for. AAA 1B has, has that that hub already built out. Um, and so just remembering to point people in that direction can be really helpful. Um, Senior Living Week is next week. If you're not familiar with that, um, I believe you got a uh, um, an email from, from Stephanie about Senior Living Week, uh, but it is next week hosted by the Housing Bureau for Seniors. A series of programs, events, speakers, resource fair, lots of lots of really great things, um, and it actually really pairs nicely with some of this living uh, housing conversations we've been when we've been having. Um, and then finally, remember to share with your networks about the commission applications. Specifically, I know that we've been talking a lot about 
um, diversity, particularly racial diversity on our commission. And so now is a great time to talk to your networks to um, make sure that we, we have some of that representation in our next iteration. Um, any questions about the report from Marta in Marta's absence? <laughs> All right. Um, the only item that I have underneath new business is a reminder again to share the application about our commission and others. Does anyone else want to bring up any new business at this time? I don't have new business, but I do have a question, so I don't know if this is the right time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. I feel like I've lost track of where exactly is the um, the ARPA fund approval at the um, county commission? Has that officially been approved? Yeah, so Jason was um, at the beginning of our meeting and gave us that update. So the four million for seniors has been approved. And currently they're working on the setting up the infrastructure. So Peter was talking also about developing the review schedule and developing the review team. And once they have those things in place, they have, um, they're gonna put out the RFP. Um, they do have to make some movement on this quickly. They're re Peter was saying that they're reaching the two year mark for ARPA funds. And so as soon as they have the details together, they're going to share it with us and we need to be able to push it out to um, the network. And so um, I think that you get our emails anyways, but I was going to make sure that we got it to, to you so it could go to the HAC and all of the other groups that I know you're a part of. Um, yeah, any other specific questions about that? Uh -huh. That's helpful. Um, I okay. guess just one quick follow up. Did Jason mention um, a timeline for actually allocating the money? I mean, I know that there's when it has to be spent by the federal government's timeline, but does the county have a timeline where they want that money distributed? Um, they did not share that. I know there is one because Peter mentioned that they're getting close to the two year mark and then there's some other things that happen after that, but they didn't share those those dates with us. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right. Then I have our next meeting set for November 4th at 8.30. Um, we hope to have Karen from AARP here to talk about livable communities and age-friendly communities. Um, and we're going to have a rough draft of our annual report for you all to review at that meeting as well. Yeah, Margie. Oh, you're muted. I was just going to remind people that um, in the minutes, it, it, there is information about how to g get information ahead of time for our next speaker. So um, okay. it's a pretty um, um, uh, full website with a lot of information. So we might want to get into that prior to having our next meeting. Margie, was the information that I downloaded so for our needs assessment um, subcommittee after we met, I sent some of those resources. Was that more helpful than looking through the site? Well, I, I don't if so, know. I can share it with I, everybody, but if you didn't find it helpful, then I, I send it to everybody okay. and um, people can use what they want. Okay. Yeah. Great. I'll do that. Okay. Elizabeth. I'd also suggest including in that the website, because sometimes uh, I don't always keep track as well as I could of past things that have been sent out. Great. I'll do that. All right, then to adjourn, we don't need to do a voice vote, but if you just want to give like your thumbs up, raise your hand.
We do need a motion to adjourn. And oh, we need a motion to adjourn. Will someone make that? I'll motion? move. Thank you. Support. All right, now we can do thumbs up, Stephanie. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. We'll see you on November 4th, if not sooner. Okay, thanks, Marie. Thanks.